Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left Hill, he and his corps were driving east to meet Grant and the Union Army in the wilderness. The Orange Turnpike and the Orange Plank Road that Ewell and Hill marched on respectively began to diverge at about the moment Union forces started to engage Ewell to the north of Hill's columns. Lee urged Ewell to not bring on a general engagement until Longstreet could reach the position, but there was no stop in the Army of the Potomac under the purview of Ulysses S. Grant. A general engagement erupted on the Orange Turnpike, and Hill's men began to encounter resistance from Federal cavalry and a few infantrymen. Lee was in a desperate situation. The gap between his two corps threatened the integrity of the entire army. Because of the tangled mess of the wilderness, road junctions proved vital for both armies, and both sought the Brock Road Junction with the Orange Plank Road. Lee wanted it in order for Hill to arrive at the junction and push north to hit the flank of the Union soldiers attacking Ewell's front. However, Union forces arrived at that location first and began setting up fortifications. Hill, Lee, and Stuart sat in a clearing at the Whittletap farm, which provided a good view of the ground before them. They studied a map, determining what Hill's corps could do to help relieve Ewell's embattled lines. All of a sudden, Lee rose up quickly. A Union battle line emerged from a pine thicket just 200 yards away. Stuart cautiously rose to his feet as well. Hill remained seated due to the incredible pain it took to move. Hill gazed at the Union soldiers, but then, as quickly as they emerged, they retreated back into the thicket. Heath's division pushed forward, and about four o'clock, fighting in Hill's front began to rage. Winfield Scott Hancock threw three divisions of Union soldiers against Heath's 6,700-man division. Lee personally sent Wilcox's division north to hopefully link up with Ewell's right so that the front would be stable. With the battle raging in his front against overwhelming numbers, Hill ordered 16 artillery pieces under Pogue to form up in the clearing. A staff officer pointed out to him that in case of a breakthrough, no road existed to transport the artillery safely. Irritated, Hill stated, I know this. In battle, the guns must take their chances of capture. They will help to hold the line if such an emergency occurs. Union brigades began battering Heath's line in front as well as on the flanks. Lee recalled Wilcox and ordered him to come in on Heath's left. With a shout, the South Carolinians under McGowan swept through the area like a tornado, as Wilcox described it, driving the enemy away from Heath's left flank. The reprieve was only momentary, and the Union lines reappeared, strong as ever. Some of Hill's Georgians remembered fighting at right angles and sometimes back to back against the Federal troops in the dense forest of the wilderness. Regiments became entangled and Hill being the only unifying officer in many situations, personally directed his troops in this horrific encounter, all the while suffering from severe physical pain and a rising fever. Hancock continued his assault against Heath's men and at least one brigade in Heath's division began using dead soldiers to form a breastworks against Federal bullets. It was growing dark when a courier rode up to Hill and informed him of a division headed toward the gap between his and Ewell's lines. Hill had committed all of his available troops and he could not pull regiment out of line because that would make the whole line crumble. The only available unit was the 5th Alabama Battalion who were guarding prisoners. Hill put them in a skirmish line, told them to rush through the bushes and woods screaming the rebel yell at the top of their voices and to give every indication that they were the lead elements of several brigades. The Alabamians bravely did as they were told. This handful of soldiers crashed through the underbrush, fired their muskets rapidly, and screamed themselves hoarse. Wadsworth's Union Division had gotten lost earlier in the day, and then had been pounded in the battle before getting lost a second time. When this new Confederate attack came toward them at nightfall, the Federals stopped in their tracks, threw up breastworks, and called it a day. This day represented one of Hill's greatest accomplishments as a Corps commander. With only 15,000 men, he held off nearly 40,000 soldiers of the enemy. He placed troops effectively and inspired his Corps with his presence at the front. However, Hill had fought against excruciating pain all day, and when night came, his fever got worse, and his whole groin hurt. He sat down and stared into a campfire, too exhausted to move in order to shore up his lines. Lee put forward his plan for the night and the next day. Hill would move his corps north to link up with Ewell, while Longstreet came up and took the place of Heath and Wilcox's divisions. If Hill did fill out a report, it has been lost. Heath's account remains the only good source on the situation, but his is suspect because it appears his intention was solely to absolve himself of blame. 
He claimed that he and Wilcox approached Hill to ask that their lines be reformed. Hill waved it off and said reforming in darkness so close to the enemy's lines was dangerous, and leaving the area meant leaving the wounded, for them to stay where they were. Hill added, Longstreet will be up in a few hours. He will form in your front. I don't propose that your division shall do any fighting tomorrow. The men have been marching and fighting all day and are tired. I do not wish them disturbed. Allegedly, Heath came to Hill three times and requested to reform the lines, and on the last one, Hill angrily stated, Heath, I don't want to hear any more about it. I don't want them disturbed. In that respect, Hill was just following Lee's orders for the men to rest until Longstreet arrived to relieve them. Heath also makes a ridiculous claim that he spent two hours searching for General Lee to go over Hill's head and claimed he could not find the army commander. The reason for this ridiculousness was Lee's headquarters sat right behind Heath's division and Lee was in his tent all night, so Heath's story remains highly suspect. At five o'clock the next morning, Hill rode off to inspect the gap between his and Ewell's lines. Scarcely had he disappeared when Longstreet arrived at Hill's headquarters, greeted by a member of Hill's staff. Longstreet explained he was about two miles away, but as he did, a blast of musketry erupted in Hill's front. The Federals were attacking. For half an hour, Heath and Wilcox's men held their ground as best they could, gradually falling back. The more experienced soldiers performed a gradual withdrawal, while the less experienced rapidly fell back. In the clearing at the Widow Tap farm, the situation turned into a crisis, with Confederate troops streaming through the open ground. Wilcox approached Lee, wanting to know his instructions. Lee said, Longstreet must be here. Bring him here. Wilcox sped off on his white horse up the Orange Plank Road to find Longstreet. Hill tried partially in vain to get his soldiers to reform. It was no use. By this point, no cohesiveness existed. Hill directed Pogue to fire a double canister over the heads of the retreating Confederates at the Union troops pushing through the tree line. His staff worried that the artillery might hit wounded soldiers on the ground, but Hill simply stated the guns must open fire. Fire they did, blasting large holes in the Union lines. There was no Confederate infantry line. All that remained was Pogue's artillery. Hill, the former artilleryman he was, began helping to load and fire the pieces at the Federal soldiers. By seven, Longstreet's corps arrived and began pushing down the Orange Plank Road. Hill assembled his corps and pressed off to the north to fill the gap in the Confederate line. He reached an abandoned farm far ahead of his troops and dismounted to relieve the pressure on his lower back. He stood there studying the topography when just 100 yards away, a Federal line appeared. This was twice in two days he came close to either capture or death. Hill calmly told his staff, mount, walk your horses, and don't look back. The Federal troops were under Ambrose Burnside and Hill quickly formed his corps to combat the approaching Union soldiers. Aggressively, Hill battled against Burnside and kept him at bay. When darkness covered the field, it brought a well-needed rest for the troops. The next day, Lee discovered Grant was on the move towards Spotsylvania Courthouse. He ordered Hill to the southeast to block Grant's movements. On this march, the pain required him to walk, not ride, and this drained him of his energy. He finally gave in to his illness and told Lee he could not continue. Lee placed Jubal early in command of his corps, while Hill rode laying down in an ambulance near his troops. Early commanded Hill's troops effectively at the fight near Spotsylvania Courthouse, and when Lee convened a council of war at a church behind Confederate lines, Hill attended. Lee addressed General Heath by telling him to have his troops in readiness to attack. Hill spoke up and said, General Lee, let them continue to attack our breastworks. We can stand that very well. Heath seconded the thought. Before he left, Lee stated, This army cannot stand a siege. We must end this business on the battlefield, not in a fortified place. On May 15th, Hill felt he was well enough to take command and did so for a short time. During that period, Hill ordered General Wright's brigade to take a hill near Snell's Bridge across the Poe River. Hill watched as Wright horribly mismanaged the situation so badly that another brigade had to be sent to complete the task. Hill was furious and vowed to haul Wright in front of a court of inquiry. Lee took Hill aside and gave him what amounted to a lecture. These men are not an army. They are citizens defending their country. General Wright is not a soldier, he is a lawyer. I cannot do many things that I could do with a trained army. The soldiers know their duties better than the general officers do, and they have fought magnificently. Lee pointed out that a commander had to do the best he could with what he had. You understand all of this, but if you humiliate General Wright, the people of Georgia would not understand. Besides, whom would you put in his place? You'll have to do what I do. 
when a man makes a mistake, I call him to my tent, talk to him, and use the authority of my position to make him do the right thing the next time. On the 16th, Hill relapsed, going back into excruciating pain, and rode in an ambulance again near the front. His doctor pleaded with him and then with his family to urge him to get a sick furlough to recover his health. Hill responded, I cannot leave my command, and just as soon as possible I shall take charge of my brave fellows again. 